okay so now you understand what tensors are and what are the tensor notations which we are going to use in this course now let's move to the next part where we're going to discuss about the stress invariant Consider a stress state sigma ij defined relative to a particular rectangular Cartesian coordinate system Oxi and i in this case varies from 1 to 3 so we have axes as x1, x2 and x3. Based on this rectangular Cartesian coordinate system if we take an infinitesimal material element as you see on the screen then our stress tensor can be defined as these nine components so this way you can define the stress state so you will have nine components the direct components will always be related to the axis coordinate which you are using so sigma 2 2 is the force in two direction and the area of this surface in two direction as i explained in the previous part so this way we will have three direct components and similarly three shear components if it's a symmetric stress tensor if it's not symmetric in that case we will have six shear components so if i want to write it down in the matrix form so this second order stress tensor sigma ij where i and j both varies from one to three based on the rectangular coordinate system can be given as this where sigma one one sigma one two sigma one three are coming from this plane then similarly for the from the other planes we have the other three components and this way we have in total nine stress components which are which define a second order stress tensor now if you look at the magnitude of the components in each individual component of the second order stress tensor then it will depend on various factors depends on the geometry it also depends on the applied loading how the loading is being applied on this structure also the location of this infinitesimal material element where you have taken this small cube of material from and also the orientation of the coordinate system orientation of the coordinate system is a very important thing and changing the orientation of the coordinate system changes everything and that's what I'm going to explain in the next few slides now. so let's say rectangular Cartesian coordinate system as x o x1 o x2 and o x3 if I rotate this Cartesian coordinate to o i O X I double prime in this case the new x1 axis will be x1 double prime x2 double prime and x3 double prime respectively for x1 x2 and x3 axis so now if you look at the stress tensor which was based on the previous Cartesian coordinate system everything has been now rotated so your material element has been rotated and this means you have newer double prime components of stresses as you see here which may be different than what you have in the actual coordinate system so if you want to obtain these new components of stresses in the new coordinate system then you can obtain it based on the values from the old coordinate system and the angle of rotations which your coordinate system has been rotated for How you can do it you can use this kind of transfer transformation matrix which transforms one coordinate system into another coordinate system based on the direction cosines and what you do is basically you find the angles between the individual axes and then you try to find out the direction cosines and that will give you the rotation or transformation tensor which is a second order tensor again and that you can use to find out the updated stress values in the new coordinate system what you have to do is you have to multiply the actual stress tensor which is in the actual rectangular coordinate rectangular Cartesian coordinate system with these transformation matrices as shown here and that will give you the updated stress tensor in the new coordinate system so AIG I already explained to you is a transformation tensor and whose components are the cosines of the angles between the old and the new coordinate axis. This is just an explanation of that so you can read through it 
and it's based on the summation rule so i hope you are familiar with how the matrices are multiplied so in this case we have a three by three matrix three by three matrix and three by three matrix or in tensor terms it's a second or all of them are the second order tensor you're gonna get nine components in each tensor okay so now you understand that the components of the stress at a point depends on the orientation of the coordinate axis and you need to use that to define the stress state so remember the components of a stress at a point depend on the orientation of the coordinate axis used to define the stress state and the maximum direct stresses for all possible orientation of the coordinate axis are generally called principal so what you are trying to do you are trying to find a stress definition which is independent of the orientation of the coordinate system and that's called principal stresses in in solid mechanics so what you do you uh, what you do is using the concept of equilibrium of forces on material element we can easily find out the relationship for principal stresses from the equations which are given here so we apply the force balance on that material point and we will end up with this kind of determinant which is equal to zero so all the forces in static equilibrium should be equal to zero it's based on that so again i'm not giving you the whole derivation of it you can look at any solid mechanics book how they reach to this determinant value now if you want to solve this you need to really see that you you have three of those sigma unknown values and this means you will have three simple principal stresses because once you expand this determinant you will have a cubic equation so in a 3d stress state we can say that we will have always three principal stresses so as i told you this gives a cubic equation in the principal stress and after expansion you will get an equation which would look something like this where i1 i2 and i3 i have denoted as sigma kk then i2 is minus half sigma ij sigma ji minus sigma ii sigma jj if you remember from the first part of this course sigma kk means repeated index so you need to add all the values from 1 to 3 so it will be i1 will be sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3 similarly you have to calculate in order to calculate this you need to vary both i and j from 1 to 3 so there could be many different combinations and you have to consider all those combinations and i3 is a determinant of sigma ij which is given as this value here so these are generally termed as stress invariant so for a 3d stress state you can have three different stress invariants and their values are independent of the orientation of the coordinate system so whatever coordinate system you are using and how much you are rotating your coordinate system these stress invariants never change which and when i say invariant these are these i1 i2 and i3 so these values will never change thus the roots of this equation which will be the principal stresses in the cubic if you solve this cubic equation the magnitude of principal stresses will always be independent of the orientation of the coordinate system because the roots of this equation will depend on these three invariants and they are always independent of the orientation of the coordinate system and hence we say that principal stresses are independent of the orientation of the coordinate system so i hope it is clear what principal st stresses really mean and you you see a lot of times in post-processing fe results you come across principal stresses as well now let's consider again a stress state sigma ij and again it is defined to a particular rectangular coordinate system oxi as i showed you before the stress state will in general result in a deformation which is made up of two parts so when you are starting deforming your material point or your material then the stress state will cause two types of deformation one is called a volume change and the other one is called the shape change so one will try to change the increase or decrease the volume of the object and another one will try to distort it right the shape of the object so this this brings us to the two new quantities in stress analysis one is called the hydrostatic stress and the other one is called the deviatoric stress 
So whichever components of the stresses are involved in changing the volume of the material during deformation, then that those component that component is called hydrostatic stress, and the one which is associated with the change in the shape of this object or material point is called the deviatoric stress. So in general, the stress tensor is given by the sum of hydrostatic stress which is sigma kk over 3 because generally hydrostatic stresses when you are applying stresses or forces in all directions like a hydrostatic pressure a cube for example inside a fluid is under the hydrostatic stress and that is basically all about pressure so in this case it will be the sigma kk over 3 plus the deviatoric part of the stress which will try to shape, change the shape of the component uh, what what are these two quantities so sigma kk as you remember repeated indices so you always have to add the same indices together so it will be sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3 as i explained before and if you remember sigma ij will have nine components while the delta ij here is given as is basically the identity tensor if you are more familiar with matrices so you only have one in the diagonal rest of the components are zero or it's, it's also termed as chronicle delta in continuum mechanics which means if i is equal to j then it's equal to one and if i is not equal to j it's equal to zero so for example delta one one will be one delta one two where i is not equal to j will be zero and so on so it is in a way the definition of the identity matrix or tensor and that is what's written here as well okay so i hope this is clear now how to compute the hydrostatic stress high stress tensor is comprised comprised of two stress components one is called the hydrostatic stress and the other one is called a deviatoric stress hydrostatic stress changes the volume and deviatoric stress changes the shape or distorts the shape of the Okay, now if you want to look at that components of deviatoric stress so since we already know or we can measure the actual stress state so we know the stress tensor we can easily compute the hydrostatic stress based on this definition right because sigma kk will be sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3 over 3 times this identity matrix so that will be then subtracted from this actual stress tensor and then we can get the deviatoric stress tensor which will be changing the shape of the object so if you want to write this down in the matrix form then it basically is the deviatoric stress will be sigma 1 1 minus this half of this sigma 1 2 sigma 1 3 will remain the same because delta ij will be zero so this whole term get zero in the off diagonal matrix and then the diagonals you will add this kind of values so deviatoric stress is a measure of the level of shear stress so it's, when you are trying to distort it it's mostly shear effect right and we will shortly see that this deviatoric stress is the stress which dictates the onset of the blasting deformation so and that will then give us kind of a yield criteria for which is more relevant to this course and in order to do that again now we need to find out what are the invariants of the deviatoric stress because again deviatoric stress is taken directly from the actual stress so it may be the case that by changing the orientation of the coordinate system it will change so we need to look for the invariants of this stress tensor which is a deviatoric stress tensor and that will basically make us independent of the coordinate system as we did it for the principal stresses so we do the same exercise here so, in, so we find, try to find out the invariance of the deviatoric stress and again we solve that matrix equal to zero as we did it for the actual equilibrium and in this case we end up with three invariants for David from deviatoric stress and this time we call them j1 j2 and j3 the j1 is very similar to what we had previously which was sigma kk in this case it's sigma kk prime because it's the deviatoric component of the stress tensor 
similarly j2 is given by this and this is again very similar relationship as i explained to you in the previous slide here uh, where when i give you the principal stress relationship uh, which is here so you see this is very, these are very similar but only thing is the prime which means j1 j2 and j3 in the next slide are basically coming from the deviatoric stress tensor not the actual stress tensor and deviatoric stress tensor we have computed using the actual stress tensor minus the hydrostatic stress tensor so these are these thing and now the onset of the plastic deformation in ductile material depends on the magnitude of the second invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor first invariant if you if you had already paid attention to what i have been saying is again the repeated indices so sigma 1 1 prime plus sigma 2 2 prime plus sigma 3 3 prime so it's a hydrostatic part kind of hydrostatic part of the deviatoric stress but deviatoric stress is already without any volumetric part because we subtracted from the total stress the volumetric part so this one will not have any volumetric part so if we have done all the calculations correct then this j1 will always come out to be zero right because there is no volumetric part into it so the only thing which is more critical in this case is j2 and this is the one which is used or which is found to cause plastic deformation in ductile materials and it depends on the magnitude of that again i am not giving you the derivation but this is the one which we're going to see later on is used in the, or many of the yield criterions or predicting the onset of plastic deformation 